No, that's a video feed. That'll be for the And then there yeah. could be a share audio. Yeah, so that's shared. Yeah, just a Well, the audio's on. It's very strong. Yeah, but there's, there's a special um, command to the audio. Otherwise, you're missing the audio to the bottom. Okay. Yeah, so, so normally, um, when you share screen, it's usually something you click on the desktop yeah. that you want to share. Oh, okay. There it is. That's what we want. Yeah, we, we do want that. Yeah. So, so we could change it to yeah, yeah, and so at the front end. Right, yeah. Yeah. And so when you want to share that, we'll just go back and stop share and then click on that. Yeah. Okay. okay. So it's going. Okay. Yeah, this, this doesn't seem to be very well done, but but again, uh, yeah, well, we have to figure out what's happening. Okay. Yeah. 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 So is that run continuously, or do you? Well, we'll start it again. Yeah, okay. let's be, we're just doing it as people gather. Yeah, usually. We're yeah. targeting 11. So. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, with everybody, all the activity out there. Yeah. Yeah. When the mosquito is on, it feels like it's one with your foot, and it makes the mosquito shift. Okay. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thanks for being here today. We certainly appreciate it. And our uh, presentation today is going to be on the legislative process. As, as some of you might know, uh, Heidi and I are uh, new to Washington. And so we've taken the opportunity over the last year to try to engage in the uh, legislative process so that we can learn more about the state and, and really make this our goal. So we feel it's very important. To be involved politically and so uh, with the community through yourselves and others in order to be able to really have this as our home. So, what we want to do today is share our experience. So, we're not going to try to convince you of, of one political view or another. <laughs> this is about how the system works, when it's how we can how we're in the system and, and really try to uh, convey the uh, opportunity that exists for each of us as citizens to be able to work within the, uh, the legislative process ourselves. Okay, let's see if I can find it here. Yeah, it's cool. I think there's. Oh, yeah. yeah, it seems like it picked up. Funny you say so, because usually people tell me to pop down as opposed to sleep down. <laughs> so I'll not try to repeat that. I would like to say we're delighted to be here to, to share our experiences with you in the legislative process uh, and uh, look forward to a, a dialogue on this because it's not just you know, what we've been doing, but what all of us you know, can be doing uh, in order to provide. Uh, uh, leadership in our state 
and and uh, make it a better place to live for all of us. Thank you. So we're going to get started with a uh, kind of a gold goldie, just to get everybody in the right frame of mind here. A uh, snippet from Schoolhouse Rock, probably originally ran back in the 70s, about what it takes for a bill to become law. Uh, that's a very little bit of what we're going to talk about today, but again, it's in the theme. So, yes. Is it sung by Tina Turner? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I'm looking for that one, and I think about it. <laughs> so, no, unfortunately not. You sure got to climb a lot of steps to get this capital building here in Washington. But I wonder who that sad little scout speaks for it. I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. And I'm sitting here on Capitol Hill. Well, it's a long journey to the Capitol City. It's a long week. I'm sitting in committee, but I know I'll be a law someday. Stop. I pray that I will, but today I am still just a bill. Gee, Bill, you certainly have a lot of patience and courage. Well, I got this far. When I started, I wasn't even a bill. I was just an idea. The folks back home decided they wanted a law, so they called a local congressman, and he said, you're right, there ought to be a law. And he sat down and wrote me out and introduced me to Congress, and I became a bill. And I'll remain a bill until they decide to make me a law. I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. And I got as far as Capitol Hill. Well, now I'm stuck in committee, and I'll sit here and wait while a few key congressmen discuss and debate whether they should let me be a law. That they will. Today I'm still just a bill. Listen, those Congressmen are Is all that discussion and debate about you? Yeah, I'm one of the lucky ones. Most bills never even get this far. I hope they decide to report on me favorably, otherwise, I may die. Die? Yeah, die in committee. Yes, I'm on my other bill. And if they vote for me on Capitol Hill, well, then to the White House, where I'm waiting on line with a lot of other bills for the president to sign. And if he signs me, then I'll be your you mean even if the whole conversation should be allowed, the president can still say no? Yes, that's called a veto. The president vetoed me not to go back to Congress and they vote on me. By that time, it's very likely that you become a law. It's not easy to become a law, is it? No. But I will pray, pray that I will. But today, I'm still just a bill. Besides the bill, now you're a law. <laughs> Maybe while I'm doing a brief intro here, you can get us switched over to the yeah. slide. All right. So, um, you know, when Steve initially suggested moving into the opening, I was dubious and I said, I'm new. You know, I'm not sure it works that way. And then uh, watch this through, and I'm like, no, this is exactly what I saw happening. You know, over and over again, these things um, they're birthed, usually within the legislature itself. Sometimes they come from us, I mean, the people. Um, and then they go into committee in one house, then we bounce to the other house where they, you know, if assuming they get out of committee and are voted on in the house, then they go to the other uh, chamber, in this case, we'll say the Senate, since so there's the house where they go into committee. And uh, this was a short session, so it's kind of amazing to me to watch everything move as quickly as some of it did. Uh, we are going to look uh, probably somewhat briefly at eight bills, six of which became law this year. Kind of talk a little bit about them. That's the handout that we put on the table there. That was way more than I was going to put on this one. All of you, it's crazy. But uh, you can look at this, you'll see um, eight bills that C9 um, had a chance to experience um, in various ways. So we'll talk about those. Um, but before we go there, I think we're going to have Steve give us a quick look. Most of us, I think, either live 
who are in a weaker group, but there were a lot of people in the 26 that were sitting there. So we'll take a look. Who's representing us? Um, does anybody need the uh, handouts? Yeah. And sure. then uh, we'll talk more specifically about these bills. And then I think, you know, we'll talk a good bit about what it was, how it was that Steve and I got involved. Um, I think these are, and hopefully, if you all have stories of how you've been involved, you'll you share your information with us. I think it's always much more fun as a conversation rather than as a presentation. And we'll talk a little bit about some tips and tricks about um, how we uh, communicated the things we discovered that we thought maybe might get through a little better to some of our representatives. And finally, the time lapse, we'll talk about getting information and how you can get more information. We have what I think is a rather fantastic uh, state legislative website, but I'm not going to say it's easy to read. Okay, so uh, if, again, if time allows, we'll pull out the pointer and kind of show you how we accept some of the pages and figure out what we information we were going to use to communicate with our representatives. Okay. All right, and another thing I will say is any of you would like to give us your email address? This entire presentation and that handout are hyperlinked. Uh, what we wanted to do since we have a whole lot of information uh, over the past few months is share that with those of you who are interested. And so if you'd like, we can email the presentation and hand that to you, and you can just click away and explore on your own. Yep. All right. So let me do a quick survey and see how many people have been involved in the political process uh, in the Washington, Washington State level. So uh, that's a that's a great uh, a great indication of, of how politically active our congregation. So we can probably learn a lot from you, and, and don't hesitate to raise questions or tell us that we don't know what we're talking about as we're going through this, because this has been our learning experience that we're wanting to share today. So uh, the uh, delegations for um, our district, uh, legislative district twenty six, are illustrated up here. Uh, as I'm sure you probably realize, there are two representatives and one senator that uh, they cover our, our jurisdiction, and they're listed here. Uh, so uh, in the upcoming election, there's going to be some changes in our, our legislative uh, um, membership. So uh, Emily Randall, who is a, a senator, is running for the open uh, congressional seat, the federal congressional seat. Uh, and uh, uh, Representative Spencer Hutchins has decided not to run again. Uh, Representative Michelle Cal uh, Calmier is uh, running, as, as far as we know. She's going to uh, be on the ballot in, uh, in the next election. So there's probably going to be, well, certainly going to be turnover in the uh, in, uh, Representative Hutchins' in seat uh, and perhaps in Senator Reddy's seat as well. So whenever there's turnover in a uh, legislative body, that's the opportunity to really raise some new ideas and new perspectives. In. There's an opportunity for the citizenry to have much more uh, direct impact. Uh, I think we all can, can look at the political experience our nation has had over the last uh, few decades, that once someone gets into a leadership position uh, at the state or federal level, they tend to stay there for a long time. So it's these opportunities for turnover that really provide an opportunity to, to shape uh, the legislation uh, that we uh, experience as citizens in our state. So, yes. Um, when it comes to the little map that you have, uh -huh. it's got uh, that one jiggy job in it, and then this pink area. Well, how uh, is the pink significant? And then in the jiggy job, there's like a gray area. <laughs> yeah, so, and I'm sorry that the map is so small, but we, we tried to use it as an icon. So there have been some changes in the legislative balance. And so I believe, and, and I'll squint up here at the legend to make sure I get this right, um, the uh, uh, pink area is new residents have, who have come into the district. So that was uh, formerly part of a, another legislative district. It's now part of this 26th legislative district. The, uh, the crosshatch area, is um, something that's marked as former residence, it looks like. That, yeah. that that area has been taken out of the legislative district and assigned to another. So it's the redistricting that happens uh, every 10 years as part of the, the, the result of the census 
Yes. Uh, on that map, where would you put Gate Harbor? Uh, Gate Harbor is, uh, yeah, it's here. Let's see if we can do the uh, pointer here. Yeah, I can see it. We're like. So Gate Harbor right there. is right in here. So here's here's the Tacoma Bridge, 16 going up, and so Gate Harbor uh, is in this area. And, and what is on the east side? Yeah. So the west side. Yeah, this is the key peninsula over here. This is going up to Port Orchard. Yeah, but there's a line right through. Right. Yes. Yeah, it goes right down the channel that separates the peninsula from Bishon Island. Is it first? Yeah, or that would No, the 26 is going through the uh, uh, Tacoma Narrows. Right. So, okay. so it's isolated to the fence. Well, the reason I mentioned it is I think you're to the right of the blue line. Oh, right there. Yeah. Well, I, this is this is the light our home is oh. not in here. Oh, okay. So you're not on the 26th. Yeah. Okay. okay. Oh, that's interesting. I was just curious why they did that. Yeah, well, this this is the, the channel between uh the peninsula and the shop. That's not land. Yeah. yeah, that's one. Oh, that's one. That's right. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. So you're so that's bad. That's right. This is shot okay. here. Okay, never mind. I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Bonnie. So, so, let's see. so where do you see that job come across? Is that a street? Is that like 144 or this right here? Yeah. I I'm not sure. I, I, it might be. I I don't know. I didn't. Spend a lot of time. Sitting. It looks like sometimes. Well, this this is not divided, so the entirety of this area is the twenty six. Oh, you know what I think that is? I think that's a county line. I'm yeah, well, that's, that's true. That's the difference that's between Pierce, Pierce and uh, oh, exactly. and Pittsburgh. Yeah, yeah thank you. Okay. All right. So I think again, because if you are probably in the LD twenty six, we want to make sure we weren't being exclusive to those. So. Um, again, if you're curious, um, maps can you be found right here again. All right, thank you. So, so um, if you're not in LD26, go to the website of the Washington State Redistricting Committee for yes, and you can uh, commission it and then figure out where the new yeah. Okay. All right, so now we're going to move on to some bills. <laughs> um, roughly categorized as health and social justice. Um, I would say even some of the healthcare bills fall into the category of social justice, and a lot of those that are more on social justice have a lot to do with education. So it was a super interesting session. Um, so again, looking at this, I'm going to kind of go through these kind of quickly. If any of you have questions, we can slow down. Uh, I'm not going to present myself to Steve, an expert on any of these bills. We experienced them as we did. And uh, in my case, a lot of it was filtered through almost 40 years of experience working in business and healthcare. So uh, I had some, some pretty strong feelings about what some of these bills were trying to accomplish. So the first one we're going to look at, the shorthand for the first one is called the Keep Our Care Act, also known as COCA. Um, Senate Bill 1541, because it originated in the Senate. Um, Hope that this was its second year um, trying to get through, and it did not make it through a host of reasons. I think there was fairly strong opposition from um, the provider community. Um, although I think we have to say, in terms of what happened in the legislature um, last year, it didn't even make it out of the Senate. This year, it moved out of the Senate into the house and I don't know, maybe two more weeks could, could have made it through. But uh, it, it basically, it timed out and yes, it was opposition. So what is COCA designed to do? Keep our care, what does that mean? Well, in Washington State, and most of you have been here long enough see that, but uh, a lot of you know that consolidation of healthcare entities has been a very big thing. Here in, um, in our county, in our Peninsula, Peninsula, we have CHI Texas Bank, working with a host of entities right here in Gate Harbor. There's a Virginia Mason CHI Texas facility. Okay, so that's one. 
There's someone in Seattle too, from Providence, merged with Swedish. So what do consolidations mean? Okay, they're not all bad. Um, in fact, I think there's a reasonable argument that healthcare consolidation helps ensure the continuity of healthcare for a lot of us because some of the smaller practices and facilities simply can't continue to operate. However, consolidation can also be restrictions in care. It's happening. And there were three primary areas that have been observed in the Puget Sound area. And those areas are um, gender affirming care, that's one. Um, end of life care, can you receive medically um, medical assisted medication assisted care at the end of your life? Um, I think there have been restrictions there observed up in the Bremerton area specifically, and also reproductive health care, a range of reproductive health care. And those are just three. And why are those three significant? I think you can say that in many cases, the you know, uh, most marginalized populations. So it is a concern. Yes. Is it, uh, is it emerging with uh, Catholic services? I mean, is it uh, that yeah. That's I don't know if that's fair. It's that does seem to be an underlying factor. Yes, just to put it right on the table. Yes, yeah, another so fact. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm one of the Medicare uh, volunteers mm -hmm. with counseling, and I've got notices that uh, Blue Cross. Advantage plans are negotiations with the defense system, system and it's not going well. So uh, that means that uh, if your uh, healthcare providers are in the system, system, possibly uh, you can no longer go to that particular. Oh, yeah. Ouch. So just there's still any negotiations, I understand, so it might change, but... And in a town where Franciscan is really the only thing going, I've had that experience myself, so thank you for bringing that up. Yes. Charlene had a question. I'm just going to say, in in rural areas, it's particularly difficult because the pool of mm -hmm. insurers is maybe one or two, and that's all there is. Right. Because everybody else is left. Right. Right, it's a real problem. Yes. yes. So is that what the CARE Act was supposed to address? So here's, a, here's the key part of CARE Act does something very interesting. What it does is it requires, keep in mind, keep our CARE Act doesn't affect or fix anything that's already happened. So that's kind of bad news for us, okay? But looking forward, what keep our CARE Act is designed to do is to say before a healthcare merger can occur, the, mer the merged entity, the proposed merged entity, must express its intent into how it will operate in a given community and allow community comment on that. Okay? So there's a process through which community people are allowed to have that. Assuming the merger is approved, the merger, the merged entity is then subject to 10 years of attorney general oversight to make sure it does what it said it was going to do. Okay? So you can see how if that had been in place five years ago, we might not be seeing the erosion of care, the availability of certain types of services that we're seeing today. Unfortunately, we're stuck with what we're stuck with. Um, because COVID, once again, did not pass this year. So we may have what we have, and another year is going to elapse. And the question is, what do we try next year? So yeah. I would imagine there's widespread uh, about this from, from practitioners. Oh, yeah. Well, really, more than... Well, yeah, so, um, so, so lobbying in, okay, so in the first place, let's, in, before we go to the lobbies, let's go to who's behind this, okay? Or at least who's sponsoring yeah. it. It has a very powerful sponsor in Emily Bank. Okay, so I think that helped and probably helped move the bill out of the Senate and into the House for consideration. Okay, in terms of lobby groups that we know or advocacy groups that we know are in favor of it, I'm sure there are many more than this. But the two that we can name, we have direct experience with, are the Gender Justice League and Planned Parenthood. Okay, so, and I'm sure there are. 
groups. Now, there, there are other groups uh, yeah. committed to end-of-life care right. uh, advocacy as well. Yes. Yes. Um, so my concern from my experience is, does this just keep hospitals nonprofit, or does it make them for profit? I'm not sure it has anything to do with that. It doesn't change. I know that when I was working for rehab, mm -hmm. that if I had a farm worker that was injured that was not a citizen, the only place they can work is at a nonprofit. When the hospitals start going to be for profit, you can't work with people working. I, I think that's a. a, a you want to? Yeah. yeah. I, I believe that's a somewhat separate issue in the sense that. Uh, right now, nonprofit hospitals uh, are uh, more willing to provide services on documented uh, people in the country, as opposed to for profit hospitals who are driven by their uh, economic objectives to try to limit them. So, uh, what we see is public hospitals and not for profit hospitals carry the burden for those who aren't, aren't insured, and that includes any of the undocumented people in the country, and as well as uh, people who just don't have the uh, access to health insurance, either through their employer or through uh, Medicaid types of services. So uh, the bill that we're talking about really does address that specifically, but we see behavior that is analogous across these various circumstances, where uh, medical groups, even nonprofit groups, uh, seek to manage their liability exposure. And that means trying to uh, withhold or, or manage the care that they offer uh, in a way that might not necessarily meet our needs as either citizens or as patients in those institutions. So, so that's part of the challenge that we have, is how do we uh, provide the appropriate incentives to institutions of various types in order to get the, the care that we need uh, for the Right. Okay. So that oh, oh. so we we do have an option of changing providers in some cases. In some cases, right. I lost my primary care provider a few months ago. I looked at my health insurance. I have I have ridiculously rich health insurance scale and things. Um figured I wouldn't have a problem. Everybody's in the system. And in all the weeks to get a new doctor, some doctors have waited now since 2025. Maybe, maybe if my if the case was better because my doctor retired, so they felt obligated to give me another doctor. And, 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 and it happened quickly? Yeah. Nice. So then three weeks. We can't yes. answer the question. Oh, I said, I said right. if you want to change, how can we change doctors? You know, how can you change doctors? And I'm saying maybe I was typical, but maybe I wasn't because my doctor retired. So maybe they made it easier for me to stay with the system, which was not the system, uh, for the reasons I you enumerated. So, um, but I did notice that finding a medical doctor was far more difficult than finding um, another degree. That's actually the thank you. It doesn't get a concern for all of us. <laughs> yeah, and, and I said yes. in my comment, I said that my system system to negotiate for two cross. Actually, it was multi-care. Well, oh, yeah. 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 sorry. Well, multi-care there <laughs> multi there in essence, trying yeah. to reject uh blue cross advantages. Wow. So so this is a complex area. We certainly don't know all the details, but uh, there's a lot of experience that all of us have of jointly and working in, in the healthcare uh, environment. And that's the type of experience that was very useful to bring into the legislative discussion. So what we found as we reached out to uh, members of, of the, um, uh, the 26 district uh, legislative uh, uh, membership is that hearing from, from their constituents about real problems that people have and being able to talk about solutions to those problems is very meaningful. And that really does drive behavior, drives understanding in part of, of the legislators uh, to hear that experience. So all of us collectively 
have the ability to reach out to uh, to the legislators and, and share the individual problems that we have and then we look at, at those common solutions which uh, can help uh, remediate some of those issues. All right. Well, thank you for that that, that conversation. I think that you know, COVID is a pretty important bill. Maybe we'll be fortunate. We'll come back next year. But uh, in the meantime, in the meantime, we don't have um, anything uh, in place. No protections currently in place beyond existing law with respect to mergers. So let's talk about a few success stories. Um, how to find the Affordable Care Act preventive services. What's this about? Um, I think you all probably heard the Affordable Care Act is, um, it's been under fire for years. I think generally speaking, it probably has been viewed more favorably than not by people in the country or in this country. Um, among other things, it, uh, it, it, it uh, gives all of us access to health insurance through the exchanges of requirements to have health insurance. And there's a pretty broad set, a set of preventive care services that must be delivered um, free of charge, right, or to us. No go pay. Our insurers pay, but we don't put any money on the table when we go to receive certain types of preventive care. So that particular provision, the uh, no cost, no copay for preventive care, is um, probably somewhat at risk in Washington right now. Fortunately, Washington, D.C., that is, in the, uh, the nation's capital. So it may fall as a national requirement, but in the past session, our legislation, you remember our legislators unanimously in the House and Senate, no name of us whatsoever, um, codified um, no cost for preventive care services for us in the state. So we would be protected even if the national law falls. Now, I will say there is some interesting language that crept into the plan. Uh, bill will become law in June. And it has an interesting phrase. This applies to non grandfathered health care plans. I wasn't able to dig deeply enough to find out whether that takes the teeth out of the law or not. But as it looks, you know, or as it appears, I think it's probably more likely than not that we would, most of us would be protected in the event of national law fell. And this is important. Because there is actually some evidence um, done through a pretty major study about 30 years ago that whenever there is any payment for health care, even, even co payment, we are less likely to go and seek that care. We know it's not a universal, but we're likely to not. So the co pay uh, free provision actually protects all of us by encouraging us to be able to take care of ourselves. Okay. Um, any questions on that? Did it take a long time for them to get to this point? That's not by years, or did it just happen? This was, a, I believe, a single year bill, in and out. Right? There's another one on here, I can't recall which one it was, that came back through when I think it passed a year or two, but yeah, I think that was a single year one. Uh, as is the case for the next one, which is regulating ultrasounds, this one's kind of unexciting, but it's still been approved. Basically, this says that in order to use an ultrasound machine, you must be a medical practice or a medical practitioner. Yeah. So you kind of wonder what was going on after that law. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. So let me suggest what was going on out there that, that required this law. That is that uh, you know, in, in the great turmoil in our country around reproductive rights, uh, there are institutions that have been promoted that are maternal care centers, how they, they label these things. Uh, they tend not to be medical facilities in the sense that, that there aren't uh, medical professionals involved, but one of the tools that they use is ultrasound in order to... Uh, uh, more... Exactly. Thank you. I, I'm trying to avoid Yes, an insurgency. Uh, <laughs> I have no. <laughs> to to, <laughs> to encourage an attachment between the, the mother and the fetus. So, you know, that it, it was really aimed at trying to remove that type of, of uh, emotional uh, lever in the process. Well, I don't know. 
You know, another thing that's that absolutely true. Uh, another thing that suggests, though, is that you know, no matter what, um, you know, no, nobody who is a medical practitioner should be in the business of using a sophisticated medical device because you can wind up doing harm, right? And it's like there's just a range of things. So no matter how you look at it, it's just it's a problem. So, and I think this one also, yeah, you know, interestingly enough, there was some opposition in the Senate. Okay. Um, yeah, that's because a lot of these packaging numbers that one did not. It was 30 in 30 um, in favor of passing 19 against. Okay. Um, and I believe and, that was a lot of party lines. Yeah, probably. Um, all of our representatives, who by the way, we have a the Democrats, we have Republicans and our representatives, um, all voted in favor. All right. Um, the next one, the last health one we're going to look at is one called expanding access to post exposure prophylaxis drugs. Uh, this is making sure that medication is available, for example, so that when a, an assault victim goes into the emergency room, they can receive preventive treatment against contracting the AIDS virus. Okay, so believe it or not, that medication has become increasingly less available. This now requires emergency rooms to stop it. Okay. So that's what this means about. Again, thank you. You know, the past unanimous. So. All right. Education. So this one is fascinating. Materials about protected classes. What's that about? This one is actually, yes, this one is actually about book banning and curriculum banning. Yeah. Um, or it's exactly the this. Okay. So basically, this says that if you're a school board of directors or a um, school board, you can't approve or prohibit the use of a, uh, a textbook, instructional material, supplemental instructional material. Basically, you can't stand up and say, you can't use that material because it talks about the class. So if you have you know, the achievements of famous Black Americans, whatever, you cannot stand up and deny the use of the materials for that reason. So again, another fascinating that you know just that, that we need protection against. Yes, folks. Uh, I'm really very pleased to see this mm -hmm. because the gay part of the racial justice mm -hmm. are worried about the school board being pressured by moms for liberty um, mm -hmm. against this very um, provision. Yeah, and also the one on the other page of um, parents mm -hmm. over exclusive learning works experience. At, they're very strong and powerful about uh, limiting um, what school districts and school personnel can do. Mm -hmm. So I'm very thrilled to see that this is gone through. Do you know when that takes place? Should, or all of these, I believe, will be effective in June. Oh. Well, in June or July 1? June. June. June is the day that Yeah. So I have a question. The end part of this, um, where it says, uh, it would study more of the contribution of any individual or group as part of a protected class. Right. What does that mean? Uh, racial, ethnic. Uh, right. Uh, the groups that it would be possible to discriminate against. So, so the groups that you 